he told Vladimir Putin to stop the election meddling and, quote, we won't have it. Republicans support immigration and customs in the face of a Democratic effort to abolish the agency. And the boys from that Thai soccer team rescued from a flooded cave speak out about their adventure. This is Special Report. Good evening, welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. For the second time in two days, what President Trump said and what he meant are the subject of considerable interpretation, confusion, consternation at the White House. During a cabinet meeting today, President Trump was asked whether Russia is still targeting the U.S. He said no. A few hours later, his press secretary said that no was not in response to that particular question, but rather a no to no more questions. Now, he's expanding more on what he told Vladimir Putin behind closed doors. Of course, of course, all of this comes after yesterday's stunning retreat on comments questioning Russian interference in his election victory. Correspondent Peter Ducey starts us off tonight from the White House. Good evening, Peter. You might need a whiteboard for all of this. We'll see if we can get by without a whiteboard at the White House. Brett, good evening. As you know, President Trump has been taking some heat the last few days for not confronting Russian President Putin about election meddling in public. But now the president says that he stood up for the U.S. in private. I let him know we can't have this. We're not going to have it. And that's the way it's going to be. President Trump also said he blames Putin for election meddling and holds him responsible as Russia's leader. Earlier today, the president was asked if Russia ever stopped interfering. Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you let's go. That no raised eyebrows because it's the opposite of what Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats said two days ago, that the Russian threat is ongoing. But the White House spokesperson claims the president's answer to the Russia question wasn't what it looked like. You had a chance to speak with the president after uh, his comments, and the president was said thank you very much and was saying no to answering questions. A reporter in the print pool disputes that clarification, writing, your pooler in a previous report today characterized it as Trump responding clearly to the reporter's question and in doing so claiming that the Russian government was no longer targeting. Your pooler stands by that report. Something more clear at that meeting, the president's more muscular rhetoric towards Moscow. There's been no president ever as tough as I have been on Russia. Earlier, the president pushed back on critics who panned his performance at a news conference with Putin, tweeting, so many people at the higher ends of intelligence loved my press conference performance in Helsinki. Putin and I discussed many important subjects at our earlier meeting. We got along well, which truly bothered many haters who wanted to see a boxing match. Big results will come. Now administration officials are complaining that progress made days ago on issues in North Korea, Syria, and Ukraine aren't being covered. Why aren't you covering everything that actually matters between Russia and the U.S.? Excuse me, there's more than election meddling. But Democrats who want to make sure that the president didn't make any deals with Putin in private are trying to haul the American translator who was in the room with the president to a public hearing. Democratic Congressman Bill Pascrell writes, We need public testimony by the only American president at this meeting to ensure Trump did not further undermine our intelligence or law enforcement communities. Democratic Senator Gene Shaheen elaborates further. It's clear that there's no transcript, yet the Russians seem to know what was said and what was um, agreed to. I think it's important for Congress to know that as well. And so if the president is not going to share that with us, then the interpreter is the one in the room who may have some of that information. The State Department is looking to see if a translator has ever testified like this before. Republicans don't think one should. If there are any deals done, I want Pompeo to tell us about it. I don't need the translator. That's all politics. What I want is Congress working together, Team America on the field, not Republicans and Democrats. We also learned this afternoon that the president is going to meet with his team to figure out whether or not the United States should honor a request by Moscow to let Russian authorities interrogate a handful of Americans that they think may have committed crimes in Russia. So far, though, Sarah Sanders says those are just conversations. No commitment. Brett. 
Peter Ducey at the White House. Peter, thank you. The State Department came out after that press conference and said that will not be happening. We're talking about the story. The British businessman mentioned by Russian leader Vladimir Putin in his news conference with President Trump. He's now reacting to Putin's request that Peter just mentioned that the U.S. provide him to the Russians for interrogation. Bill Browder is a longtime critic of Putin and has called the Russian president unhinged. He's not happy with President Trump either. I've spoken to a number of members of Congress who are absolutely appalled and in shock that, that uh, President Trump would be siding with Vladimir Putin and going after me and going after a number of senior uh, U.S. officials um, uh, and, and ready to hand them over. It's just beyond belief. Again, the State Department said that is not going to happen after that White House press conference, despite the president saying it might be an interesting idea while in Helsinki. Browder will be Martha McCallum's guest on the story right after special report. House Republicans have passed a measure supporting ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, in the face of a Democratic effort to abolish the agency. We have two reports tonight. First, Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel on Capitol Hill. Please. With calls from the left to abolish immigration and customs enforcement, or ICE, House Republican leaders decided to put Democratic lawmakers on the record. I urge my colleagues to look into their heart, vote on this resolution, reflective of your own deepest belief. The non-binding resolution in support of ICE required two-thirds support from House lawmakers, which it earned with a 244 to 35 vote. Democrats used the opportunity to hammer the family separation issue. This resolution is the legislative equivalent of fiddling while Rome is burning. This resolution does nothing to prevent the separation of babies from their mothers. 133 Democrats voted present to avoid being in support or opposed to the men and women enforcing the nation's immigration laws. The House Majority Whip blasted Democrats for lacking courage. Last year, ICE agents, they rescued or identified 518 victims of human trafficking. What if those ICE agents would have voted present that day instead of rescuing those victims of human trafficking? Luckily, Mr. Speaker, they didn't vote present. They showed up and did their job to keep America safe. And Republicans called on Democrats to stand up to their liberal base. While hashtag abolish ICE might make for a catchy bumper sticker for radical leftists, it is harmful to our law enforcement. But the House Democratic whip defended his rank and file members. Democrats refuse to play. Republicans game when it comes to children's well-being and the safety of those who come here seeking asylum. We're not falling for this trap. House Republican leadership considered bringing up a measure sponsored by three House Democrats calling for abolishing ICE. They wanted the glory of introducing a bill to the far left of their own party, but they didn't have the guts to accept the consequences. Late today, Senate Republicans try to call up a similar resolution supporting the men and women who carry out ICE's mission, enforcing the nation's immigration laws. It was blocked by Senate Democrats. Brett? Mike Emanuel, live on the Hill. Mike, thanks. Let's take a closer look now at what ICE is, what its people do, and the future of that agency. Here's correspondent Jillian Turner. Abolish ICE! Abolish ICE! ICE is responsible. To, to protect the sovereignty of this country. It's been a tough few weeks for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency known as ICE. Now, defenders of the embattled government agency, including its recently departed leader, are fighting back. I've never met a bigger bunch of patriots, um, hardworking people that are dedicated to protecting this country. Though barely 15 years in existence, this government agency now faces an existential crisis. Congress created ICE in 2003 as a direct response to the tragic events of 9-11 and gave the agency a unique double mandate, protect U.S. national security interests abroad and the public safety of Americans here at home. It has wide-ranging authority, but its primary mission is to enforce federal laws governing the U.S. border, customs, trade, and immigration. In a nutshell, ICE keeps the bad guys out. On average, we stop 10 known or suspected terrorists per day from coming into the United States. And that's primarily the function of ICE and TSA 
uh, working together. Today, ICE has over 20,000 people who work in 400 offices in the U.S. and around the world, and an annual budget of approximately $6 billion. Now, lawmakers who oversee the agency and support its mission want the American people to know ICE is well worth the price tag. They stop these human traffickers uh, exploiting children, uh, drug smugglers also. In 2017 alone, ICE seized almost a million pounds of narcotics, including the deadly drugs, heroin and fentanyl, continuing to fuel the opioid crisis. Also last year, ICE arrested 143,000 criminal aliens they claim are responsible for 11,000 weapons offenses, 5,000 sexual assault offenses, 2,000 kidnapping offenses, and 1,800 homicide offenses. While many Democratic lawmakers may no longer see the utility of ICE, the majority of the American people do. A recent Fox News poll Poll finds that by a margin greater than two to one, American voters are against disbanding the agency. Brett? Jillian, thank you. Republican Congressman Jim Jordan met Monday with investigators from a law firm looking into allegations that a na now dead team doctor sexually abused male athletes at Ohio State University decades ago. Jordan was an assistant wrestling coach from 1987 to 1995. He says he was never aware of that abuse. Jordan has repeatedly denied some former wrestlers' claims that he knew they were inappropriately groped by that doctor. A Russian woman accused of spying for the Kremlin made her first court appearance today. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin has the latest from the Pentagon. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Brett. Maria Butina pled not guilty to charges. She was a Russian agent. The judge denied her request to appear in civilian clothes and ordered her held without bail after the Justice Department made the case that she was a severe flight risk. Russia's foreign ministry called the allegations far-fetched, designed to ruin the Helsinki summit, quote, it looks as if the FBI, instead of carrying out their responsibility of fighting crime, is implementing a political put-up job set to it by forces that are whipping up anti-Russia hysteria in the U.S. The FBI began tailing Butina soon after she entered the U.S. on a student visa three months before the presidential election. She attended campaign events and CPAC. She hosted American gun enthusiasts in Russia going back to 2013. One delegate delegation included Milwaukee Sheriff David Clark. She began a romantic relationship with Paul Erickson, a South Dakota-based GOP operative. Butina's lawyer said the 29-year-old was simply a grad student at American University, adding his client did not flee after the FBI raided her apartment on April 25th, a week after she testified behind closed doors in front of the Senate Select Intelligence Committee investigating Russian election meddling. The top Democrat on the House Select Intelligence Committee says Republicans on his committee blocked them from issuing subpoenas to Erickson and Butina. We, for example, had Paul Erickson uh, on our list to be brought in. Uh, he was somebody who engaged in correspondence about using the NRA as a back channel to the Russians. We were not permitted by the GOP in the Intel Committee to do that work. Butina's next court hearing is next Tuesday. Brett. Jennifer Griffin live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thanks. Let's talk about the summit, the president's comments, plus the latest with the Russia investigation. Andrew McCarthy is a former U.S. attorney, National Review contributing editor, and a Fox News contributor. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Brett. You know, I want to play a little bit more of that CBS interview that's uh, airing tonight. Uh, CBS News sat down with the president again today, uh, talking about what he said on election meddling. Take a listen. You say you agree with U.S. intelligence that uh, Russia meddled in the election in 2016. Yeah, but, and I've said that before, Jeff. I have said that uh, numerous times before. And uh, I would say that that is true, yeah. But you haven't condemned Putin specifically. Do you hold him personally responsible? Well, I would, because he's in charge of the country, just like I consider myself to be responsible for things that happen in this country. So certainly, as the leader of a country, you would have to hold him responsible, yes. What would you say to him? Uh, very strong on the fact that we can't have meddling, we can't have any of that. Now, look, we're also living in a grown-up world. Will a strong statement, you know, President Obama supposedly made a strong statement, nobody heard it. What they did hear is the statement he made to uh, Putin's very close friend, and that statement was not acceptable. Now, he's referencing there uh, Obama talking to Medvedev. Uh, just take a listen real quick. Yeah. Um, After my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. 
understand this by transmitting this information to Vladimir. So um, he went on to say, the President, President Trump did, uh, we're not going to have it, he says, he said, behind closed doors, and that's the way it's going to be. So your thoughts on all of this and kind of the past two days of the back and forth? Well, I take comfort, Brett, in the fact that he has taken a much stronger position now, which is reflective of the fact that he understands and his administration is trying to be forceful in the idea that this is the position that we have to take. Um, I think it's unfortunate uh, that he made the remarks that he made at the, at the summit. One wishes that he was prepared at the summit to make the kind of statements that he said today. Uh, and he's going to pay the price for that because that story is now going to go on for a number of days, no doubt. Uh, but the important thing when the dust settles is that this is the position that it, we seem to have settled on. It's also the right position. You know, the, the administration says a lot of things could be accomplished potentially with Russia. Uh, you wrote today that, that Russia is also a fading country and that perhaps the president was swinging below his belt. Well, you know, look, I, I think Russia is complicated. It's got, it's got very accomplished defense assets, intelligence assets. It's a force to be reckoned with in the world. It's also a country that has a lot of problems. And from our perspective, the most important thing about it is that, is that this regime is committedly an anti-American regime that annexes the territories of other countries, murders people or attempts to murder them uh, in the streets of uh, cities in the West. Uh, and is really incorrigibly anti-American. So obviously we have to deal with them in the world. Uh, as Mitt Romney said in 2012, they're our most important geopolitical enemy. I think they turn out, he turns out to be exactly right about that. Um, we have to deal with them, but we should deal with them from a realistic posture, which is that they're not in it for us. You know, I said right after the news conference that um, the analysis of this president is that he didn't seem like he wanted to decouple uh, any challenge right. to his win or Russian interference, like couldn't pull those apart. Can I turn to the investigation that's ongoing? You have Lisa Page up on Capitol Hill, Peter Strzok, um, they've already testified. You now have the FBI Director James Comey tweeting that uh, voters should vote Democratic. You have the former CIA Director. Uh, um, John Brennan saying that uh, this is potentially treason. Where, where are we on that side of the coin? We're unfortunately seeming to go in the wrong direction on the issue of the intelligence and law, law enforcement apparatus of the government having to be completely outside and above politics. I've tried to cut some slack, not only because I, I used to work with a lot of these people and I thought highly of them, uh, but also because they were thrust into a situation where they were unavoidably in the mix of the politics of the 2016 election. And I think part of the way that we ever repair this is to restore the idea that these are apolitical institutions of the government that answer to the political branches but don't participate in politics. And when you see the kind of remarks that are being made on, on Twitter, I think it's really unfortunate. It, it makes people say that to the extent the critique of our law enforcement intelligence agencies has been that they were politicized. If they're playing politics like this now, why should anyone doubt that they were playing it when they were in power? I have 15 seconds. Obviously, we don't know what the Mueller probe is going to show. We don't know what we don't know. But on the other side of the investigation, do you think more shoes will drop? I, I think ultimately what, where it comes out is that there's no collusion type crime. Uh, and there's no obstruction, uh, but the special counsel will find that there were some disturbing things, there were some disturbing people that were recruited into a campaign, that it was proper for the law enforcement and intelligence people to be suspicious about it, but there were irregularities. All right, Andrew McCarthy, uh, thanks as always. Thank you. Up next, the young soccer players rescued from that flooded cave in Thailand talk about their incredible experience. You'll want to hear this. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. WSVN in Miami as a fourth body is found the day after two planes collided over the Everglades. It was discovered this morning by fire rescue crews. The search has been going on since Tuesday afternoon when the FAA says two small aircraft crashed into each other.
Fox 29 in Philadelphia as Pennsylvania's highest court upholds the city's tax on soda and other sweetened drinks, rejecting a challenge by merchants and the beverage industry. The state Supreme Court ruled the one and a half cents per ounce levy is aimed at distributors and dealer lever level transactions and does not illegally duplicate another existing tax. Both dissenting justices say the tax does duplicate taxes already in place on retail sales of soda in that city. And this is a live look at San Francisco from our affiliate Fox 2. The big story there tonight, Google says it will appeal the European Union's record $5 billion fine for using the market dominance of its Android mobile operating system to force handset makers to install Google apps. The EU says that has reduced choice for consumers. Google says the Android has created more choice, not less. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. Members of that youth soccer team trapped in a flooded cave in Thailand for two weeks, heading home from the hospital tonight. As they were leaving the hospital before kicking a soccer ball for a while, they told stories of their incredible adventure to reporters. Correspondent Benjamin Hall has the highlights. They were trapped in an underground cave for more than two weeks. And now all 12 boys and their soccer coach have left the hospital where they were being treated for dehydration and malnourishment. The boys are addressing the media for the first time since being rescued, giving us our most detailed account so far of life inside the cave and the moment they realized they were trapped. I was thinking, oh, we would be able to get out, try to calm down. I did not feel frightened. The boys say they first tried to dig their way out of the cave and continued to do so till they were rescued. They had no food, but they did have some water and a flashlight, which they conserved throughout. But by the end, some were fainting from hunger and very weak. I was really afraid not to be able to return home. They described how they stayed strong by meditating and controlling their breathing to conserve oxygen. I told everyone to fight, not to defeat. They described the moment they were rescued as a miracle. We heard some noises, perhaps people talking, so we told each other to be quiet and listen. We weren't sure, but then yes, it was true. I could believe it. They paid special tribute to Saman Kunan, a Thai Navy SEAL who died while laying down oxygen tanks along the rescue path, saying they felt responsible, but his sacrifice wouldn't be forgotten. They plan to honor Kunan by entering the monkhood for a period of time. Doctors now say that other than a few minor infections, the team is in good shape. They're now heading home, where friends and family have been preparing for weeks and say they'll take good care of the boys. If he wants anything, we'll buy it for him as a present. We promise that when he gets out. Whatever he wants, we'll do it. Four of the team, who are currently stateless, have now been granted Thai citizenship. And what they've all said is they now want to live life to the fullest. Some have even said they want to become Navy SEALs. Brett. Amazing story. Benjamin, thank you. The U.S. State Department says an Iranian lawsuit against the U.S. over reimposed sanctions is baseless. Iran has filed the action at the International Court of Justice. It contains the, or contends rather, the sanctions renewed after the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal violate a treaty dating back to 1955. Those sanctions are contributing to an economic downturn in Iran, which has led to public protests there in recent weeks. A Turkish court is denying a request for the release from custody of an American pastor based in Turkey who's on trial on charges of aiding terror groups and engaging in espionage. Andrew Brunson was arrested in the aftermath of a 2016 coup attempt for alleged links to the outlawed Kurdistan Workers Party and a network led by a U.S.-based Muslim cleric who Turkey blames for the unrest. The U.S. State Department reiterating the administration's call for Brunson to be released. Up next, why a Las Vegas hotel is suing the victims of last fall's concert massacre. At the U.S. Interior Department confirms to Fox News it is investigating a possible conflict of interest concerning Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke and a real estate deal involving energy companies over which he has regulatory control. Specifically named as the chairman of the Halliburton Corporation, House Democrats contend their dealings invite questions of whether Zinke is using his office for personal gain. Zinke has defended his relationship with Halliburton Chief David Lassar. 
New York Democratic Governor Andrew Cuomo is being accused of trying to manipulate donor statistics after campaign finance reports revealed small contributions from individuals on or associated with his own staff. Cuomo first faced backlash after the New York Times reported one donor contributed to the campaign 69 times. The man, who shares the same address on his filing as a Cuomo campaign aide, donated $1 to Cuomo 67 times and $5 twice. The head of the state Republican Party says Cuomo is trying to make it seem like he has a lot more support from small donor grassroots donors small dollar grassroots donors, I should say. A Cuomo campaign aide tells Fox News it's pretty standard to reach out to a campaign's network of people for support. The company that owns the Las Vegas hotel from which a gunman killed 58 people last year is taking tremendous public relations fire tonight. MGM Resorts International is suing the victims of that slaughter. National correspondent William Lajeunesse tells us why tonight from our West Coast newsroom. 58 killed, hundreds injured. Now come the lawsuits, not just from victims, but also from MGM Resorts, which is launching a preemptive legal attack, hoping to shield itself from liability, stemming from a failure to stop gunman Stephen Paddock and his nearly two dozen weapons. How deep in the swamp does MGM want to jump? How low do they, do, do they want to kick victims like myself and other survivors? A PR nightmare, perhaps, but the casino hopes a brilliant legal strategy. MGM is filing its case in federal court. Court, claiming a law known as the Safety Act shields the company. MGM lawyers argue the law precludes any finding of liability against plaintiffs for any claim for injuries arising out of or related to Paddock's mass attack. Plaintiffs have no liability of any kind to defendants. Lawyers for the victims disagree. It wasn't meant to provide immunity for a hotel casino who had woefully inefficient security process that didn't, you know, all the bells and whistles that were going off that they didn't catch. MGM claims because the concert security vendor was certified by the Department of Homeland Security against terrorism or acts of mass destruction, it is not liable. But neither the sheriff nor the FBI classified the shooting as terrorism. Even if a judge somehow says this was terrorism and the safety act applies, they have to prove that the security system they had in place was effective. MGM claims Congress after 9-11 stipulated all litigation related to mass violence belongs in federal court. Victims prefer state court, which is considered more friendly to their claim that MGM was negligent in providing security. Brett. William, thank you. President Trump is praising Alabama Congresswoman Martha Roby for her winning the primary last night in Alabama. President Tweeps, congratulations to Martha Roby of the great state of Alabama on her big GOP primary win for Congress. My endorsement came appropriately late, but when it came, the floodgates opened and you had the kind of landslide victory that you deserve. Enjoy. A House spending bill is proposing $5 billion to pay for the president's border wall. That's well above the $1.6 billion provided in the Senate version of the measure. Meanwhile, the administration is racing against another deadline for reuniting children separated from their parents attempting to enter this country. Correspondent Casey Stiegel has the latest tonight from Dallas. Busloads of parents have started arriving at the Annunciation House in El Paso. It's one of four locations around the country identified by the federal government to assist the migrant families once they're reunited with their children and released from ICE custody. So the government is centralizing the release process. Garcia says volunteers are working around the clock from helping families locate housing or medical services to linking them up with immigration lawyers since they'll have future court dates. The pace of releases will increase dramatically in, in the next couple of days to where we may be looking at as many as 100 individuals, 50 families per day that will come to us. HHS says all but 71 of the 2,551 separated children ages 5 to 17 do have a parental match. However, the government will not disclose how many reunions
evictions have already taken place ahead of next Thursday's deadline. Illegal entry doesn't disqualify you from getting your child back. This as new battles continue in court. A federal judge this week temporarily halted the deportations of migrant families once they're reunited. The ruling was in response to a brief filed by the ACLU, which cited growing rumors of mass deportations being carried out immediately after the reunification. We will have at least a week in which those families can consult about their options and decide what to do. A lawyer with the U.S. Department of Justice expressed opposition to that week-long suspension of deportations, but did not address whether the rumors of mass deportations were in fact true. Brett. Casey Stiegel in Dallas. Casey, thanks. President Trump says the new Air Force One planes will be red, white, and blue. The president tells CBS the two replacements will use patriotic colors instead of the current baby blue put in in the Kennedy administration. The White House says the $3.9 billion contract with Boeing for the two planes saves taxpayers more than $1.4 billion. On the markets today, the Dow was up 80, the S&P 500 rose 6, the Nasdaq was off a fraction. When we come back, the panel with reaction to the confusion over the president's latest comments about Russian interference in American elections and what he's saying now. The president was said thank you very much and was saying no to answering questions. But you haven't condemned Putin specifically. Do you hold him personally responsible? Well, I would because he's in charge of the country, just like I consider myself to be responsible for things that happen in this country. So certainly as the leader of a country, you would have to hold him responsible. Yes. What would you say to him? Uh, very strong on the fact that we can't have meddling, we can't have any of that. Now, look, we're also living in a grown-up world. Will a strong statement, you know, President Obama supposedly made a strong statement, nobody heard it. What they did hear is the statement he made to uh, Putin's very close friend, and that statement was not acceptable. I let him know we can't have this, we're not going to have it, and that's the way it's going to be. Putin's very close friend, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, we played that soundbite earlier in the show with President Obama saying he would have more flexibility after the election. The president weighing in with CBS. It's uh, the third iteration now of um, the fallout from the Helsinki News Conference. Let's bring in our panel. Tom Bevan, Real Clear Politics co-founder and president. Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com. And Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Okay, Tom, uh, CBS it seemed most uh, clear what he said behind closed doors and what he says. But it took a little while to get there. Took a little while. Uh, clean up on aisle three is still going on. And look, this is, this is I think, part of what has, has been with Trump. The administration has been pretty strong against Russia. Trump has not. And he's been trying to have this, establish this rapport with Putin. Um, and he has this sort of glitch about the election, which I think caused, was the, was the, the initial cause of um, his flub in Helsinki. And he's, he's spent basically the last three or four days trying to, trying to fix that and clean it up. And I think he's now gotten to a position um, where the administration is strong, but it certainly has cost him with uh, folks on Capitol Hill and probably in public opinion as well. Katie. Well, there were some questions answered today about what President Trump said to Vladimir Putin in that meeting, what he believes when it comes to Russian meddling, who is responsible. But we also saw in the press briefing today, we've opened up a whole other controversy of questions with uh, Sarah Sanders saying that the president is, has considered allowing the Russian government to interview or interrogate uh, Americans, meaning the former uh, Russian ambassador, Michael McFaul, uh, who Vladimir Putin essentially wants dead. Um, um, we, we saw that she said that there's been no commitment from the United States to allow that to happen, but we also saw that they're not ruling it out. And then the State Department spokeswoman, Heather Nauert, had to come out and say, this is absolutely absurd. We are not going to even entertain this idea. So we have a few answers now on who the president thinks is responsible for the Russian meddling, Vladimir Putin. But now we have this very serious issue of a consideration, at least opening the door to that, uh, from the White House podium today about whether American citizens are going to be handed over to Russian 
the operatives for interrogation. Right. And they, I think, tried to clean that up at the State Department with Heather's statement. Um, and Sarah's statement at the White House was like, we're going to check it out and see. Mm -hmm. Chuck, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth, basically over the premise of what came from the Helsinki News Conference. You know, when you stand back and look at this, um, what strikes you is that the entire mess was A, avoidable, and B, entirely of the president's own making. All of this was foreseeable, and he knew these questions were coming. He knew or should have known that a certain kind of response out there in Helsinki would trigger this kind of backlash, and he kind of went there anyway. And um, this is what um, I think is most distressing to Republicans is that for the first time, the president has seemed like really out of his depth on a big issue on the world scale in a way that jarred uh, Republicans, perhaps even all the way down to the Republican base a little bit. And that's why I think he came under so much pressure to hurry up and clean this up and hurry up and start looking strong again. Because I repeat, the main thing that was troubling to Republicans, that was troubling to everybody about that performance in Helsinki was he looked confused and he looked out of his depth. So as you mentioned, Tom, the administration has been clear. The director of national intelligence just recently said this about cyber attacks. The warning lights are blink blinking red again. Today, the digital infrastructure that serves this country is literally under attack every day. Foreign actors, the worst offenders being Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, every day they are penetrating our digital in infrastructure and conducting a range of cyber intrusions and attacks against targets in the United States. So when the president tells CBS, I told Putin, I let him know we can't have this, we're not going to have it, and that's the way it's going to be, is that going to be the end of this chapter? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, maybe he said that to Putin. Maybe he didn't. We don't know. Well, the interpreter is <clears throat> being apparently called up to Congress. To Which is crazy to me that they, the Democrats think that that's an appropriate measure. But nevertheless, uh, and this is part of the problem that Trump has got himself into, is you can't necessarily, you, you don't know what, it, what he said to Putin. You can't necessarily trust what he said um, because he'll say one thing one day and, and something else the next day. So I don't think this is the end of it. Um, but, and look, while I said earlier, I think this might hurt him in public opinion in the short term. If you go back and look at all the controversies that he's gone through, Charlottesville, et cetera, and still managed to have the highest standing among Republicans, uh, you know, of any Republican president in the last half century. I think this is not something that's going to last. We'll be on to the next controversy. I'm sure it's right around the corner, and this will be in the rearview mirror pretty quickly. Just to be clear, I mean, there are many other presidents who've had one-on-one -on -one meetings that have just included interpreters. This is not... Correct. I've covered a few of them this and written about a, a couple phenomenon. of them. Right. Um, you have a book about right, that, actually. Yeah. I wasn't pitching. I wasn't one. pitching. No, I wasn't. <laughs> um, but, Katie, for Democrats to call for the translator, the interpreter, how does that sit? Well, again, here we have a situation where there are very serious concerns about what happened, and Democrats, have, again, go too far in assessing the situation, and therefore we can't actually have a conversation moving forward about what to do to fix the problem. If you put politics aside, you put the Russian meddling aside, this is about now rebuilding morale inside the intelligence community. I had people texting me who are conservative Republican Trump supporters yesterday saying, I cannot believe that he went out there in Helsinki and did this to us. We feel betrayed. We feel like we can no longer def defend this. How do we even talk about this now? So if you just put the politics aside, this is about the commander in chief now having to clean up the mess, not on Capitol Hill, not in the communication shop, but with the people who he is leading inside of his administration. And Vice President Pence and we're told Secretary Pompeo made that case that they could lose intel officials at the top if he did not do that cleanup. Next up, the future of ICE and the administration's immigration policy. The resolution is agreed to, and that objection, the motion to reconsider, is laid on the table. This resolution is the legislative equivalent of fiddling while Rome is burning. Despite the rhetoric being pushed by the left, the American people support immigration and customs enforcement. This is exactly the kind of gotcha vote that alienates the Americans from our government. We're not falling for this trap, and you can say we're doing it as much as you want. Think about those thousands of agents who are defending our border 
What do they think about a bill that comes across the desk that says you want to abolish them? Well, the House voted today to support ICE, the Immigration uh, Customs Enforcement Agency. The House vote 244 to 35. 133 Democrats voted present. The acting director said thank you to Congress for supporting the brave, dedicated men and women of ICE. You have this issue of abolishing this organization. You have Democrats, uh, the Senate and the House, and some candidates, uh, including the newest up in New York, calling for the abolishment of this organization. How it plays in America, our latest poll, abolishing ICE. You can see the favor oppose unsure. Uh, even Democrats, only 25%. Back with the panel. Uh, Tom, where does this fall? for elections coming up in midterms. Well, immigration is certainly going to be a big part of the coming elections. It's interesting. You've had this yo-yo effect, right? Republicans got caught, uh, the administration, with this family separation issue. It was a 70% issue against them. Um, Democrats reacted to that by going in the other direction, wanting to abolish ICE. That's a 70% issue against them and so you're now so now we're at 50 50 well no but but you are seeing right Democrats are, are now trying to get get move back in line um, not supporting that position trying not to and you've got Republicans and the administration now rushing to meet this deadline on the 26th and essentially going back to the previous policy which some people clarify or call catch and release so Theoretically, we're back to the status quo. You would think that might put us back in a position where you would have some sort of immigration compromise, but Congress is so dysfunctional and so tribal now, that's never going to happen. It does seem like a long way off, like that there's no way before the midterms that anything substantive is going to happen on immigration. No, there was a time not that long ago when the two parties overlapped quite a bit in immigration. Now the respective positions are build that wall is the GOP position and the emerging Democratic position might be abolish ICE. The abolish ICE thing reminds me so much of the GOP abolish the IRS, you know, or abolish the Department of Education. You sort of brand one government agency as the symbol of everything you don't like about a certain area of policy and you promise to abolish it, which whether it's politically successful or not, and I think this one privately a lot of Democrats have told me they don't like being the party of abolish ICE, it's it's never going to happen. It's a, it's a it's a wild suggestion, but it does just like abolish ICE fired up the Tea Party. This will fire up. Abolish but, the IRS, yeah. 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 Fired up the uh, sorry, yeah. yeah. And abolish ICE will fire up the Democratic base. Um, and that's really the question, Katie. Is is can the Democrats take over control with the progressives leading the way? This just seems like another example of Democrats grasping for something that will resonate in the midterms. The economy is doing well. They can't, you know, talk about that. They don't have real issues, so they're going after ICE. And let's not forget that Democrats walked themselves right into this by uh, backing the a socialist from New York who won. She said randomly that they, we should abolish ICE. Senator Gillibrand from New York then jumped on that and said, yeah, we should abolish it and try to fix it and put something new you in may there. Be running for president. Then hundreds of protesters ascended on the Senate, brought in signs and chanted for the entire afternoon about abolishing ICE. And Senator Gillibrand and a number of Democratic senators and congresswomen and men showed up to protest with them. So this was of their own making. And I think it's a good thing that the Republicans made, called their bluff on it to say, OK, do you want to make this an issue? You want to protest in the in the Senate building? Let's talk about it. Let's put it on the floor for a vote. And now you're on record as president or no. OK, panel, thank you. When we come back, animals run wild. Finally, tonight we thought we'd end with some animals, a couple of them running wild this past week, or at least trying to. A newborn giraffe at an Ohio Wildlife Conservation Center seen trying to take its first steps. It's tough. It's tough out there. That giraffe was born July 10th. Wow. Giraffes usually begin trying to stand and walk within an hour of being born. It got there eventually. We don't have that much time. In California, a bear was trying to beat the heat in a backyard pool. Take a look at this. Imagine that's your pool. The bear climbs in several fences and eventually spent 30 minutes in that pool. Neighbors and officials say the bear was no stranger to that neighborhood, had actually roamed that area before and was eventually sedated and returned to the wild, not before enjoying that pool. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and still unafraid. The story, hosted by Martha McCallum, starts right now. Like Sometimes you just have to Martha. take a dip, you know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Brett. Good to see you tonight. All right, breaking this evening, Bill Browder, who was once the West's biggest investor in Russia, now after fighting to escape the clutches of Vladimir Putin, 
fears that he may become part of some kind of exchange underway for 12 Russian intel agents after he heard this. We can 